kind of reflection somewhere, some other kind of reflections, they are reassured. In fact, uh, rationality or reason comes from a Latin term called ratio. Ratio is very familiar in uh, mathematics, but the term for reason in Latin was ratio. And ratio is a translation of, uh, of a Greek term called logos, out of which logic comes. One of the method in humanities is, is looking at terms and etymologies, etc. It gives lots of insights uh, if one uh, looks at terms. So then I introduced that there have been shifts in ideas in, uh, in the reflective career of uh, mankind. One of the major shift which I will concentrate in this lecture is to do with the idea of inscription. Inscription is, uh, is an act by which uh, certain flow of uh, life is frozen and externalized, frozen and externalized for posterity. And uh, this kind of, uh, what do we freeze in the flow of life? Uh, we freeze something which is very significant, which uh, people believe is very significant, which has to go to posterity for future and uh, for future generations, etc. That is frozen and that is, uh, this act of freezing is, uh, can be called inscription. And there are uh, usually two kinds of inscription. The two kinds of inscriptions are uh, sort of graphical inscriptions where you create some graph to indicate uh, you want to freeze something, certain meanings. You sort of uh, inscribe that on a, on a graph, our letters, writing is, letters are like that, they are graphical inscriptions and it is a very colorful thing to see what kind of graphs can inscribe meanings freeze meanings or stabilize meanings. Uh, it is a very open problem and uh, lots of experiments were done in the past which how does one freeze meanings. And uh, another is the sonic. Uh, you can also freeze meanings uh, by repeated speech. And this repeated speech thing has been a very old thing. Uh, before writing is invented or writing is, uh, uh, people took recourse to writing, inscribing on rocks. In speech, you can, you inscribe in your own mind. I mean, this is a, uh, you have to culture memory. Culturing of memory is also uh, something which is involved in inscription. So, there are sonic uh, or with the sounds can be frozen sounds which are indicating certain meaning, certain words for instance, etc. Some concepts can be frozen in sound and certain dictums can be frozen in uh, sound. And uh, there are inscriptions which are sonic oral inscriptions and there are inscriptions which are graphic, which can be put on rocks and uh, sort of uh, or even uh, in painting, etc. You are trying to sort of capture certain significant meaning for posterity. In both ways one can do this and why only sonic and visual is because that is a reason and the reason noted in antiquity why only these two modalities are available for inscription, not other modalities is because the sensory apparatus which we have, the five senses which you have, uh, in this five senses, three senses, the nature is such that the object of these senses must be proximate, proximate in the sense that if you are uh, sort of tasting, you consume that object a bit. If you are smelling, 
it has to be uh, what you smell is the aroma which or a uh, few fumes which come out of an object these fumes you consume but in vision and in sound the objects are removed objects are far away in touch objects has to be very proximate because of this far awayness of uh, sonic objects which have produced sound and far awayness of the visual objects one can in imagination manipulate the sonic content and the visual content this is uh, this is a reason why uh, inscriptions took this kind of turn either you do it in writing or you do it in terms of dictums in terms of poems which you memorize in terms of uh, speeches uh, or or uh, in terms of sayings of elders etc some of these are uh, orally inscribed much of moral realm is orally inscribed in us that one should not like last time i said uh, when uh, something serious is happening uh, the children should not disturb it like this is a inscription which is uh, oral we read it in our minds this inscription lot of moral concerns are uh, oral that way and uh, these are inscribed through ages and uh, people live up to it and even violated that's okay but uh, these inscriptions are available to us there is a fund of uh, some sounds or some uh, content comes to our mind from past moral content is one of them these are kind of inscriptions but to understand how their inscription is a is a little to intuit this is little tough and the thinkers who have looked into it uh, quite seriously what does it mean to uh stabilize certain meanings for communication and for communication which can last till for future generation so we we'll look into this inscription and uh, actually work out in this lecture a trait of uh, indic civilizations one very interesting trait which we uh, which is inscribed in us and uh, the indic tradition uh, we include one can include much of uh, china korea etc in a in a very loose way so if you look at writing these are some of the earliest systems of writing like last time i showed one one plaque which is in pakistan museum uh, at islamabad which is the earliest piece of writing it was just uh, some piece of writing where a system existed but we don't know the entire system not yet deciphered but these are systemic uh, writing very elaborate writing they tell these writings tell very elaborate things uh, elaborate things like uh, on a writing on nature of polity hammurabi tablets uh which are these ones and uh, they they speak of uh, very interesting things and it's about uh, in sumeria and babylon what kind of arrangement of political arrangement existed among people and what has to be uh, what are its dictums etc those were fixed so each of them is a different style different kind kind of graphic intervention uh, different moves in terms of what can uh, how can graphs uh, help us uh, fix the content of significance like the chinese writing is is very old and uh, it's called ideogram because uh, the graphs try to present certain ideas certain uh, maybe you can call it concepts and uh, that's why they are called ideograms 
you have writings which is Egyptian, which is very pictorial writing, it is like very close to painting. The Egyptian writing is very close to painting and one depicts uh, uh, events, it is a writing of events of a kind, even if today one has to one has to fix certain kind of writing that there are many aspects of living which are not yet, uh, they, which are not notated. There are many things which are not notated. For instance, you have uh, in the West notation for music. You do not really have notation for music in India and uh, there are aspects of music which cannot be notated. So, uh, it is an open issue how to uh, graphically fix certain meanings. Even today, it is an open issue. And there are venues where people try to enforce, uh, enforce or invent such kind of things. Well, uh, we cannot go into some details, but there are a lot of writings, a lot of thinking about these scripts which are available on net, which one can see. And uh, this is the Persian kind of script, very old, which one finds. Here is a Harappan script, which uh, images you are familiar with. This is still undeciphered. One does not know what meanings did it fix or what meanings did it stabilize, it is not clear. And lot of, lots of things have been done, there are on many texts in Harappan script, uh, all kind of analysis have been done, statistical, otherwise, uh, but till today, there is no decipherment of this script, but it is a system, it is a complete system of uh, fixing some content graphically. And uh, there is sort of what can be called Armanac and Greek script, uh, which changed lot of things, because this script is uh, alphabetic. Alphabetic is that you have a script for sound. You do not have script for ideas, you do not have script for events, you do not have script for uh, various features of meanings which are there, but you have script for sound and which are alphabetic writing and it is said that the inventional alphabetic writing really freed the domain of uh, imagination. Uh, it, it was a flip, flip in the domain of imagination and reflectivity, one of the biggest episode or epochal change in reflectivity came with the invention of alphabet. It said largely most of the books on history of ideas say that. Uh, it may be true or may not be true is, is, uh, is something which is open for reflection and uh, but alphabet could uh, one could construct structures which are very elaborate graphic structures on the basis of alphabets and fix kind of content which is linguistically elaborate content. You could fix uh, very elaborate content with, uh, with high, if I may use the word high granularity of meanings. Uh, many differentials of meanings could be handled with uh, alphabets then they could be handled with, uh, with ideograms, etc. Even modern times in China, ideograms have been uh, sort of reduced, uh, reduced to somewhat alphabetic kind in a, in a contemporary Chinese writing. Uh, so, there are, there are certain necessities and there is a domain of uh, reflection which is open today. And this domain is, uh, and this is a domain where the life as it presents to us in our mind, there are many aspects of it which are not, which are not yet uh, uh, amenable to, amenable to being uh, reused or amenable to being represented. There are many aspects of life which are, which can't be represented. So, in any case, 
there is a very funny thing or a very interesting thing which happened in India, Indian civilization that if you look at what all kind of writings were done all across globe, these writings uh, in a way there are sort of Sumerian writing, there is a Iranian writing, there is Egyptian writing, Chinese writing are there, there is Harappan writing. So, I mean these uh, inscriptions are available and uh, archaeologically it so happens that like uh, Sumerian writing goes on till, till uh, what is called uh, common era birth of Christ till that time 0 BC etcetera. Even Chinese has continuity even till today, but there is a there is Harappan writing in India, but there is a large period where no writing exists, no writing is found in the Indian tradition. Uh, Harappan things are in, in uh, Haryana, Rajasthan and around Indus etcetera in Pakistan and Gujarat you find hundreds of uh, Harappan sites where you get writing which is still undeciphered. And uh, then you have the first writings on rocks are found in uh, uh, around uh, 300 BC which are these rock writings are uh, also the famous I think three of you should get up these and get out of class. I mean you have interesting things to discuss and work out you and he you should go out of class or you will stop the class till you go out and there are better things to discuss. Thanks. <coughs> So, you have scripts which are uh, whose evidence uh, is one of the earliest evidences writing of Ashok. This emperor Ashok, he wrote many things on the on rocks, uh, say one of the in uh, Andhra Pradesh also there is a oldest writing by Ashok as well as in Delhi museum if some of you have gone right in front of the museum there is there is a rock on which Ashokan writing exists. And the writings of Ashok uh, all across even in Persia, Afghanistan and uh, lots of places of India including Andhra Pradesh and uh, Karnataka etcetera. So, uh, these for example, there is this is a writing done by Ashok uh, and uh, is done in he wrote in four scripts. He wrote in a script called Brahmi, uh, it is a very geometrical easy script in fact you can learn writing your name in Brahmi from internet just in 15 minutes or something like that. This is very close to the uh, what we know as Indian scripts. In fact, uh, most Indian scripts have come out of Brahmi. And there is another script called Kharoshti which is written from right to left and many of the other scripts which have uh, uh, including Arabic etcetera are related to Kharoshti and he wrote in Greek script the alphabets of Greek and he wrote in Armanac script. This is a, a image of his writing in Greek script and low portion is the Armanac script same content is written in Armanac and in Greek. The language behind the scripts can be different. For instance, when he wrote in Brahmi script, the language he used is uh, Prakrit language and Sanskrit language. And uh, language uh, in Kroshti was also Prakrit and Sanskrit, but language in Greek was Greek language. Uh, in the Greek script, this is a Greek language he used, and uh, also Greek alphabets. Amunak also he used Ramanak language 
Armenia is in above Dead Sea and uh, it has played a very important role in, in terms of in fact the invention of writing is placed in alphabetic writing is placed in Armenia. This is an example that is around 300 BC lots of uh, writings on rocks on pillars they are Ashokan pillars they are called Bhimlat or uh, etc which are found across India and uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran and perhaps also in Turkey <coughs> Ashokan and perhaps in Sankyang etc uh, which is in China uh, sort of western northern part of China. So, there was large amount of uh, uh, sort of in thousands of uh, pillars the head of the pillar is what is the emblem of Indian constitution the Indian state the three lions this is the head of Ashokan pillar and you can see this pillar there is a pillar existing in Delhi University campus very old and uh, uh, these pillars can be found across the country some of them were moved also uh, from uh, Mughal time it's from one place to another place they are very massive pillars which have inscriptions of uh, of, uh, of Brahmi, Greek etc. And there is a content he is writing these kind of contents are, are written as a, just as example the type of things Ashok thought is very important to important to sort of fix it for posterity and so that people can read it. Uh, which says 10 years of having been completed this is a translation from here the Greek uh, Ashok is Priya Darshi. So, he sort of uh, Greekized his name a uh, Pio Desi and uh, made known the doctrine of Eusebia to men Eusebia is is, is, a, is a very important concept uh, which he uh, sort of talked about and there is a person called Plato whose name you have heard he has a book on just this what is Eusebia the entire book is there on what is Eusebia is called Euthyphro the book and uh, to men from this movement he has made men more pious and everything thrives throughout the whole world and the king abstains from killing living beings and other men and those who are huntsmen and fishermen of the king have desisted from hunting and if some were intemperate they have ceased from their intemperance as was in their powers and obedience to their father and mother and to the elders in opposition to the past also in the future by so acting on every occasion they will live better and more happily. Now this is written by a person called Ashok who has given not only uh, the emblem of India, but also uh, Ashok Chakra which is in the flag of India. There is a wheel which is in the flag of India and it came through because in the national movement time uh, say Nehru wrote discovery of India in which uh, Ashok is or this first act of writing in India is, is celebrated in a big way and it fulfills what can be called. Uh, Indian nationalism is one of the important uh, sort of pegs of Indian nationalism and he gave uh, emblem to India. This is kind of example of writing, but this writing you find around maybe earliest of them in, in small pieces not elaborate text in around 500 BC. In between there is no script, no script is found for around 1500 years, 1000 years is largely not just script uh, even there is no baked brick found like Harappans used to bake bricks used to do uh, many things uh, urban centers existed in Harappa, but there is no uh, remains or ruins of urban centers in this period. You find urban centers uh, coming up around 500 BC, 300 BC etc like Patliputra where Mauryan's rule, but these were made of wood largely 
and uh, not really uh, stone, we do not have an archaeological site called Patliputra anywhere. Uh, so, there is the urbanity goes down in this period, there is no script and uh, there are uh, many more features of uh, like baking bricks etcetera, there are no remains of that in this period. So, some archaeologists historians call it a dark age. Uh, for India, there is I mean uh, no attempt to uh, fix any meaning of significance in this period and no way to externalize a memory, externalize one's memory uh, onto objects like uh, monuments, like uh, uh, temples or whatever uh, or even uh, using baking technology, metals and metal technology, iron is found, this piece are found here and there, but no big uh, monumental uh, or recollective uh, sort of pieces of uh, artifacts are found. Now, one of the enigma of Indian past and this is the enigma we, we have to live with, all of us have to live with, is that there are if you look at uh, compositions compositions like if you look at a poem, poem is a composition which fixes certain meaning. So, uh, it is said that uh, Harappan times there is uh, no uh, very little evidence of say Ved being there in Harappan times. In the Vedic culture is a very literate culture. Uh, but a oral culture, uh, literate because uh, all across globe, uh, for instance Rig Veda is collection of many poems and uh, sort of it has more than one and a half lakh words, a poem which has something like one and a half lakh words, it is a very large composition, you do not find anywhere. Uh, across globe, uh, such big composition you have Homer, Iliads, etcetera, which uh, come up around this period, somewhere here in the timeline. Uh, but there is no uh, elaborate composition like that. And uh, so, some people, because you have not only Rig Veda, Yajur Veda is another composition, and Samved, etcetera, and Athar Veda you have whole lot of other compositions which are called Vedangas and uh, Brahmana literature or uh, Aranyak literature etcetera. There is a large corpus of uh, literature uh, which is done and that literature is never written. In fact, the first writing of Ved uh, is happening around uh, 16th century. In India and it got printed only in uh, sort of late 19th early 20th century uh, for the first time committing it to graphemes. Graphemes are those writing uh, atoms and uh, so Vedic compositions were all oral. That is why some people think that this period with the Harappan decline and the Magadhan culture came up. This period is a golden age because uh, the way uh, sort of life has been uh, uh, plowed and put into poetry and prose etcetera which whose which contents we have today with us. These contents are available today they are not something which is lost. They were probably composed in this period and it created certain foundation of Indian civilization. Now, there is this great haters or dilemma in the image of past in India and which is that there was a period where technology is low, where urbanization is low and in fact, none almost and where 
there are lots of compositions which exist. In fact, the corpus of Vedic corpus is really large. It was one of the single largest corpus till around 18th century all across globe. The size of the uh, literature which is Vedic literature is very large. Now, this is a great uh, enigma of modernity in India, modern times. How does one reconcile with this? There is no writing, no script and there is such a large composition in this period and this you can see in the fights among historians whether it is a dark age or it is a golden age and these fights are attitudes of people. You will find these are attitudes which are there among us. I mean even each of you have uh, pr if pressed would have certain attitudes will come out related to this situation. Uh, there is something about the Harappan script is still undeciphered. I mean the project began in TIFR some 40 years ago to decipher uh, Harappan script has not really worked. I mean they made a corpus and uh, uh, did uh, lots of computing about permutation combinations etcetera and, and to work out some kind of emergent property of the script which can be called meanings and what they read. And uh, there are many proposals two three of them are alive today, but none of them is satisfactory. So, it is probably one of the most uh, unread I mean most precious kind of uh, piece from past which still is unread it is a Rappan script but it has certain traits. There are around 3000 text, Harappan text which are available today. Text is that uh, if you take an object, whatever graphemes are there in the object is considered as one, one kind of a book or a text uh, etcetera. So, there are around 3000 texts which are available today. Interesting thing about them is that these graphemes do not change over two and a half thousand years of carrier of this script. Uh, usually graphemes keep changing in two three hundred years. So, from Bhammi you can get Devanagari, you can get Tilgu. Tilgu also is a script which has come out of Brahmi script uh, because this Brahmi transforms itself into a script. Uh, which is like uh, Devanagari, a Burmese script also is out of uh, out of uh, or sort of Burmese script is also Brahmi out of Brahmi. Lots of scripts have come out of Brahmi and in Delhi museum there is a chart giving this kind of change and there are books about it. Uh, the uh, graphemes keep changing with time, but the Harappan script did not change and also Harappan script is very cryptic, it is very, very few signs lot of content probably they were fixing and the average length of a text is just 5 graphemes, 5 signs that is the average size of the 3000 text and uh, largest text is only 27 graphemes and that too in three lines and maximum lines number of lines in the text is seven. Largest text is just 27 graphemes and over three lines uh, the text over three lines has less than 27 graphemes. Uh, and one side of object maximum has three lines it is very cryptic. So, there are lot of people who believe that Harappan script did not fix language, it fixed something else. It fixed probably uh, it was a script of uh, traders, it fixed the kind of activity which is it was a script of economy rather than of language. It was fixing certain transactions, lot of people think like that. Some people think it is a cosmic kind of script and uh, it is like uh, something which is used in, in rituals and such thing. They are like, uh, like you have Sri Yantra and things of like that. These are scripts like that, they did not fix language. It is a good case. So, uh, that 
the kind of graphemes which are available or the culture of script which is available in Harappa, that script has is by its own nature unable to fix linguistically elaborate text, is unable to fix speech for instance. Speech is not fixing like if you see why uh, ideogram is also not fixing speech, it is fixing something else or hierographs of, of uh, uh, Egypt are also fixing something else not speech. So, there are uh, this script probably was incapable of fixing something like which is uh, uh, speech and elaborate things like poems uh, which are uh, elocution uh, which are speech acts. A poem is a speech act of a kind. So, maybe it is incapable of representing or fixing continuous long text. So, what does it mean to do orally inscribe? What does it mean to orally inscribe something? If even script changes over time, so if you have a long poem like one and a half lakh uh, words, even if you cram it, I mean lots of people cram it, uh, over generation, three, four generation, it will change because of various contingencies of environment and life, it will keep slipping, changing and the memory would uh, keep changing and over say 40 generations or 80 generations, it should look very different like even the scripts have looked very different over 2000 years. So, uh, how does one orally inscribe a very elaborate and long phonetically elaborate and long text is a big problem, it is a very serious problem and uh, this was solved in Indian civilization. I am in this lecture I am going to give that solution, how was it solved? How was something like uh, Ved uh, inscribed and uh, it is inscribed in such a way that even today uh, you can hear sounds is possible, you have uh, on YouTube etcetera. Uh, the Ved parties, there are people who exist who can recite Ved and the recitation of Ved uh, is something, uh, there are lot of evidence that it has not changed over time, we will tell, I will tell how, how this fiat was achieved. It was one of the great fiat of reason. How does one scribe a very phonetically elaborate uh, script? And this is something which happened in India. And this uh, fear of reason uh, is one of the uh, very fundamental trait of what we call as Indic civilizations or Indic civilization. It is a trait which is even hardwired in each of us. I mean who have had upbringing here or uh, upbringing in the parental situations of India. Uh, there are many traits which are there uh, among us which make us as a different people from say other people, say people from Eskimos or people somewhere else in Africa. Uh, what makes us different when you sort of go around the globe after some time, uh, you would uh, meet different kind of people with different cultures and different uh, sort of carvings, different cultures have carved people differently and you would see these traits when you meet people from different cultures. Unfortunately, in our Indian education system, we do not have many varieties of uh, cultural traits. There exists, but there is not much reflectivity about that. Uh, what I am saying is that Indic civilization did something uh, which created uh, many sort of uh, uh, a culturing of life uh, which makes it very different. It is a very sort of noticeable uh, traits of Indian civilization come out of one particular uh, fiat of reason, massive reasoning exercise of great reflectivity 
and uh, reason was involved in trying to fix uh, a text like a Vedic text. In fact, so much so that I mean a whole lot of uh, compositions in Indian tradition till recently, recently means maybe 150 years ago etcetera were done orally. Almost every book, uh, every, every composition done even prose etcetera were transmitted orally. So, there was a great uh, exercise of reason which was done which I am going to talk in this uh, lecture and something very extraordinary was born. Uh, it is something surprising uh, in this reasoning the idea of algorithm was born. I will just tell how uh, that is the purpose of this lecture. I will show how that happened. So, here are these people this is a picture taken from Rajmundri and uh, there is a teacher sitting there and these are people who are reading. What are they reading? I mean there is they are, they are reading out something and they are actually reading they are doing uh, it is like uh, Vedic Charan. It is a Vedic chant which uh, these kids are doing and when they are doing this chant what are they doing? What is the exercise? What is going on? They are actually reading. Where are they reading from? They are reading out of their mind or out of their memory etcetera. Uh, they are doing an act of reading and uh, reading and writing these two concepts are, are, are something which uh, thinkers have made lot out of them. Uh, we read each other, we read uh, you know just in between the lines, we read in between lines reading is a uh, the act of reading is a very sophisticated stuff and is open to a uh, lot of reflection what really is reading and what really is writing. Writing is like uh, certain say rules of triple IT they are not written anywhere, but they are on the wall somewhere in the air of triple IT and students somehow try to comply with them or uh, fudge them whatever, but these writing exists. So, writing and reading is a is a kind of uh, it is not just sort of write on the paper and uh, read from the book that is a very constricted idea of writing and reading and uh, we do all the time readings uh, we read out of air out of thin air and uh, we write into thin air and uh, that reading writing is actually happening and there is a thinker called Derrida who has made a lot out of uh, uh, lot of insight into what society polity is out of different uh, conception of reading and writing. You change the concept of reading and writing you get insights into culture, polity, economy etcetera a different insight you get if you just change the concepts of reading and writing. There are canonical concept of reading and writing which have been like 3 hours. Uh, three hours are there of Gandhi, uh, which is reading writing, which was like what are taught in kindergarten schools, reading writing, reading writing, but those concepts of reading writing can be changed. Humanities deals with this, this kind of uh, critical uh, thinking about concepts and uh, this critical thinking one can get a new idea of reading and writing and uh, how to read in between line may be the act of reading or uh, if one changes these concepts uh, whole lot of the world gets punctuated differently and one gets insights into contemporary polity even contemporary war even you know all kind of things out of this and I just gave one example of this Derrida's idea of writing and which is which gives all together is a French philosopher gives all together different insights into human phenomena. Uh, it is just an example, but here these people are reading. They are actually reading the inscribed Ved. Ved is inscribed and is claimed not even a syllable, not even a sound has slipped 
over last 3, 4 thousand years. That is a claim. Whatever the was the composition and allocation of Vedic Shukta etcetera, Vedic poems, that those sounds have not slipped, have not changed over 2, 3 thousand years. That is why in fact, UNESCO has declare, declared this as a human heritage, this act. It is not monuments are there, which are like uh, wonders of the world etcetera, which are human heritage, global heritage sorry. Uh, even this act of uh, reading has been declared as a, uh, as a global heritage thing. And uh, this is done in all kind of places in the country and villages. Uh, uh, this gets still done in less volume than it used to be done in say 10 years ago or 100 years ago etcetera is shrinking. But these are students who are learning Ved part and they are able to, they are reciting Vedas. Now, how does one avoid in a foolproof way slippage of sound over generations? It is a big problem and this problem is solved here. And uh, there are some books which are only composed and recited etcetera. They are called Pratishakhyas and Sikshas. Uh, some of them are available today, five of them are available today, others are lost. Sikshas are around 45 available. These, these books are about how to fix, how, what does oral inscription mean, uh, technology of oral inscription. These books deal with that. And uh, Pratishakha is, uh, there were many shakhas, many communities who, who, uh, who were dedicated to, uh, entire life of community was dedicated to oral inscription of it. Uh, the certain Brahmin families and villages etcetera where uh, everybody does that. And uh, these people, uh, Ved parties, uh, they learned Ved in a way, I mean there is a person who died recently. Uh, Yajur Ved is uh, larger than Rig Ved and it is in prose. Rig Ved is poetic, it is good, easy to remember Rig Ved uh, because the poetic composition, metrical and you know and sounds, the Saronas, they can be remembered because Saronity can also help you uh, memory. But Yajur Ved is, uh, is something which is uh, prose. He could recite Yajur Ved backwards from the last syllable to the first syllable. Backwards he could recite and which is meaningless, but he could do it. I mean there are people, uh, so culturing this kind of uh, recitations is uh, involved uh, thinking about speech, what really is speech and what happens in speech. Uh, this was theorized and you have a elaborate system, a theory of sounds in speech. And this was constructed and it is this theory which led to this, uh, the phenomena of oral inscription and very overwhelming phenomena of oral inscription and which is all through noted in globe uh, by travelers to India and, and uh, in modern times also. Uh, people want to record it and things like that, uh, such fear. Large number of uh, sort of, this is a case of, of a system of knowledge. System of knowledge is like if you have insights, very, very uh, sort of uh, insights into the world, uh, they do not make system. System is something which comes out of reasoning. And entire system of reasoning about sounds and speech is worked out. And there are through the system of uh, knowledge about it, a devices are constructed which will check slippage of sound and uh, bring back the sound to the original. Such devices are constructed and while doing it, while making such a theory, 
something extraordinary happened. Uh, a system of rules was born, idea of a rule. Rule is uh, if this, then this, if this and that, then this, if this or that, then this, this or that. Th these are rules. Idea of a rule for the first time, uh, rules are conceived everywhere, even Hammurabi had rules of governance and things like that. But to build a system of rules is done here and uh, in fact, if you look at the system of rules and uh, you come back to the theory of algorithm, you will see much of the ideas are present here. Uh, these are called in uh, Pratyakyas, these are called Prakriyas. Prakriyas is a term used for algorithm. How to generate from some atoms entire uh, Rigved, how does one some kind of generative thing is given and some kind of uh, uh, cross checking and error handling is done. Okay, uh, there are five things I am going to say in the rest of time which give you an idea of what this system was, system of knowledge is and the first time something called Niyam, a rule and a system of rule is born here. Uh, Sikshas give us uh, a famous table, this table has been Kakaga etc. for all Indian languages is taught in school, this table. This table is done by in the Siksha class of literature and it is based on actually pronunciation uh, variables which are there in pronunciation, how the tongue moves, where tongue touches, where does, uh, how does the volume of uh, air and obstructions of air etc. All these are worked out. And this structure is, uh, this structure has lots of information, 5 by 5 syllabic structure and it is information about how pronunciation is done. And uh, one can by certain even specification of how to pronounce a fixed sound in some way, relatively fixed sound. So, what one act was done to actually break sounds into atomic units which are consonants and vowels, uh, swara and venjana, all these are broken down and some 55 atoms were sufficient to understand Rigved. Some people for other kind of uh, speech, they were around 68 of them later on, but 55 atomic sounds are sufficient to characterize long composition like elaborate composition like Vedic. And then from these atoms of sound you make molecules, uh, molecules are like uh, actual sounds, these are abstract sounds, these atoms are abstract sounds out of which you make the sound which is spoken, which is syllable, syllable is what is spoken. A speech is a sequence of syllables, whereas each syllable has embedded in it temporally and uh, otherwise some different sounds. So, those were constructed, each label is actually co composed of 1 to 4 atomic sound and uh, so one characterizes efforts involved and actions which are involved in producing these sounds and a very interesting concept called syllabic length is produced, time taken to or duration of the pronunciation. It so happens that consonants, you cannot pronounce them in a prolonged way, you cannot stretch them temporarily, consonants. Vowels you can stretch, so if you have a poem, you put it to music, what you do is you stretch vowels uh, in the poem to render it into music. So, because consonants cannot be stretched, so things which cannot be stretched, many properties are worked out and things which can be stretched and how does one stretch them, what are the procedures for the stretching etcetera. Uh, they depend on syllabic length 
and the syllabic length is, is related to uh, sounds of certain animals etc. also. Uh, these are matras and out of matras meters can be constructed even today the metric structure of poetics in poetics that is study of poetry your metrical structures which has related to tal structure in say Indian music in Milangam or uh, Tabla uh, that is worked out. Uh, this is just a beginning and three kind of lengths were standardized. A pronunciation duration are standardized uh, out of this study and uh, related to the cycles it is like a breath cycle you have all of us breathe and uh, we breathe cyclically inhalation, exhalation etc. This breath cycle is uh, and the syllabic time how many syllable, how many syllables can one do in exhalation uh, those things are worked out like in musicians when you somebody singing you cannot find when the inhalation is there there is only exhalation but there is equal amount of inhalation also done by them but uh, uh, so the phenomena of physiology of sound production is very well understood and the slipic length is actually related to uh, cycles of sun and cycles of moon. So you can actually calculate uh, your age in terms of the number of breaths you have taken that probably is a more authentic uh, idea of your age. Uh, then uh, how many solar cycles or lunar cycles have happened which is approximate much more it is approximate if you look at when you are born earth was where and things are like that in a, in, a, in a galactic coordinates uh, is different you, you do not get an exact uh, cyclic thing but if you really count or even estimate you can estimate how many breaths have you taken till the last breath you have taken it can be computed you can assume that there is a constancy of uh, in the breath etc. So all this is worked out and we do not say okay uh, I have taken now 1 lakh breaths and celebrate you could you should do those kind of celebrations if possible maybe some culture would do and the Vedic culture did do that kind of celebration they did not have birthdays and uh, which are Gregorian calendar which has come to us and uh, it has different kind of celebrations where cycles of sun cycles of breath and cycles of uh, moon are, are uh, commiserated and the calendrical system is made all this was done. So, the speech was cosmic in some sense one had cosmic meanings when you are reciting a, a poem one had all those things at that time. Uh, also something called notes ascent was classified and standardized and the practice for ascent practice for syllable length was something which is elaborately done there is also cross checking of uh, a method by which you can cross check uh, that there is no deviation from that practice. They are very formal methods this was like a chemistry of sounds if two sounds are pronounced in a uh, this is what I mean uh, the kind of exercise I am going to describe this is exercise what uh, sort of computer people do when modeling anything computationally. Uh, so, here idea is to model human speech if two sounds are pronounced in temporal contiguity that is quickly one after another they react sounds react they produce new sounds sometimes sometimes the sounds remain same sometimes sounds are changed into third sound and uh, sometimes they remain uh, unchanged these sounds. So, there is a chemistry of sounds which is worked out very elaborately and uh, so a constraints and necessity in a succession of sounds syllabic and its atoms etcetera 
these necessities are worked out elaborately and uh, these rules of is the first time rules are formulated you can see in the history of mankind set of rules formulated for this that if sound a uh and sound a uh is pronounced together it becomes a uh. these are sandhi sandhi rules i mean uh, every language has that why is it that all sounds when we try to speak a sentence why is it that all sounds do not collapse and become just one sound is because sounds keep each other apart when we try to speak something uh, sounds distribute temporarily in a sentence otherwise uh, sounds should have tendency to collapse to into one sound if all sounds can be can be when pronounced in temporal contiguity become a third sound then all sounds will collapse into one sound but there is a pressure inside sounds they keep apart so this kind of uh, necessities involved in those forces which work around sound it's, it's like physics of sound of some kind formal uh, chemistry and physics of sound uh, not physics in sense of uh, frequencies and amplitudes which is modern physics but there is a temporal necessity which is there in speech speech is a line of succession why doesn't it collapse into one sound because there are certain necessities which are involved in this certain forces which are involved among sounds these forces are worked out and these forces are uh, are laid down are captured in four types of rules if you have to really look at what rule is uh, even today uh, try to give me the fifth kind of rule type of rules which are there these are worked out there is insertion when between two sounds some third sound comes in there is elision one sound disappears when two sounds come together there is a modification two sounds become a third sound and there is uh, two sounds uh, are uh, remain as or they collapse into one modification is that two sounds uh, change into two other sounds etc and this is like collapsing is two sounds just become one so there are forces there are forces among sounds which make them which spread them up in time and forces which uh, collapse them study of these forces was a great act of reflectivity and this led to a formulation of what can be called rule not only that that these punctuation rules are worked out these are punctuations among sounds all kind of punctuations happen punctuations are what we think in terms of writing full stop comma etc but these are sonic punctuations so a study this punctuation is studied punctuation is object of study around which for the first time in human career or human history a idea of rule is worked out not only rules are worked out so mutual reaction of 55 atoms there is a system of rules available in pratyakshas and sikshas if you want to see these things you come to ch these pratyakshas these books exist not only these rules were there something very significant is worked out something called exception rules sometimes this has happened when these sounds are put together temporarily they collapse into one sound this is a rule is saying a universal rule is saying that but sometimes that doesn't happen these are exception rules so at a meta level rules are classified into three types samanya apvada nipat samanya rules are universal rules there are exception rules and there are uh, what can be called the exception rules modify the domain of universal rule but there are some standard known particular rules which do not modify either exceptions or universals they are also listed they are called nipat rules this structure if this structure didn't exist uh, one wouldn't have uh, oral inscription oral inscription would not be possible but this is just beginning of it 
uh, this is this kind of theorization is a must to do all inscriptions then all kind of uh, depending on the concept of syllabic length and ascent similar rules can be given that if you have syllables with such ascent ascent is high pitch low pitch at pitch at which you pronounce so if pitch is high of the syllable pitch is low when they come together what would be the pitch even that is worked out ascents same rules of uh, samanapvad etc universal rules exception rules are worked out for ascent they are worked out for meters meters are you know when you pronounce uh, meters have some relation with breath cycle etc and rhythm and rhythmic structures also worked out again with universal rules exception rules and particular rules uh, so in fact permutation combinations of uh, metric structures syllabic structures and uh, these are done fairly elaborately and they represent actual uh, pronunciation also they fix the actual pronunciation you standardize in some way using them there are rules of pause worked out not only for rules of pitch ascent etc rules of pause when do you stop stop is where there is no sound when the sounds are spoken in sequence there are places where there is no sound so even those are worked out these rules and uh, for example uh, these are called chanda chanda is uh, metrical structure uh, and uh, it has their ascent when you sing something for example samved is sung rigved is not sung it has only three notes samved is sung in seven notes at seven notes is sung so music has to do lot with samved and uh, there are many things interesting things about it if you somebody is interested one can go on internet there are books and literature about it available now which deals with what really is uh, uh, are the actual rules it doesn't give you i mean there's no uh, no book no article like which is giving you actual rules but examples are there on the net and variety of insights which come out of it if you make uh, say text labels of uh, long and short and middle and long short and very long these are three syllables which are related to a say a chirp of a blue jay bird or a chirp of a peacock peacock is very long and uh, those things are there you take permutation combination of them some of them are found in rigved some are not found if some of them are found there is also exceptions to them are found in rigved so all those things are worked out in fact every poem in rigved is characterized by a meter in which it is uh, that is the tal in which it is it is characterized in terms of uh, what the theme of that poem is and is characterized in terms of which rishikul or rishi a family in which uh, that got redacted that poem and uh, every shukt there are more than 1000 shukts in uh, rigved okay this is just a base so every poem is characterized in terms of uh, there there is another thing which happens is oral indices concordance like you have lists today uh, lists they were made all kind of lists were made a uh, list of important words which are there which have significant concepts in the rigved they are made they are called nigantus and commentaries on them uh, called nirukt is one of the famous commentary and uh, which looks into these words and is analyzed the meaning of word is analyzed in terms of roots and suffixes etc and uh, there is a all this is worked out in fact there is one very interesting etymology which i often say Uh, there is slide also some time later about it is uh, the term manushya 
comes out of two words mana is there and two roots and siv siv root is there with these two roots using laws of phonetics combination a term called manushya can be made and siv root is what you find in indo greek root out of which sewing comes with a stitch suchi a needle needle comes out of sew siv dhatu and uh, one who stitches uh, with mentation the actions is called manushya those kind of analysis are found here every word is analyzed in roots and suffixes and meanings are also worked out and there are for instance some lists like 30 attempts that do not occur in the beginning of words they never occur in the beginning of words some sounds some attempts some attempts do not occur in the end etc list of 25 attempts that do not come at the end of words list of sound at the end of words that never precede specific attempts at the beginning of words all kind of uh, rules are made permutation combination etc to standardize a bo knowledge body about it about sound but that is not yet enough to fix fix uh, text uh, immutably as if you have written it on rock the claim is that vedic recitation the way it was 3000 years ago is the same which these people in rajmundri were doing that's the claim and uh, not that they are not different there are many shakhas uh, there are regional variations of rigved but they are very minor regional variations and uh, but they do exist there are many shakhas uh, odia bengali etc etc many shakhas are there now we call them odia but they are different kind different families of uh, brahmin families which are uh, around which the shakhas were made and they lived in different regions of india and in different times so uh, these lists etc are made without lists no algorithm works and uh, not only this was done even the first time concordances in dictionaries etc are worked out lexicons are worked out of vedic so from attempt to chapterization is happen every poem has a compiling family the prime theme and a the meter in it and the list this is like a index indices every poem has index of some kind so they that's a separate composition some people who know indices some other people who do recitation they can cross check kind of thing a cross checking mechanisms are constructed how is it done this cross checking this is there are seven steps in it but i can't sort of give it if you people are interested have a look by uh, rigved if you some of you are interested there is a appendix in that is published from pune which gives this uh, method and uh, it's also probably available on internet we try to find that see what is done is when i in elocution and in recitation of poetry if some of you do this kind of thing recitation uh, it's, it's a very euphoric act euphoric act in a sense if you actually do recitations you will find euphoria in it in this euphoric act the sounds are all pronounced in temporal contiguity but what you do is you break this temporal contiguity and pronounce the poem word by word if you do word by word what happens is the edge sounds of word the edges of word the beginning sound and the end sound so if you have a continuous recitation and if you have a word by word recitation the sounds will be different in the two because the edge sounds of word by word recitation will be different so there is a pad part pad is a term for word word we call it in english it's a term for it's, it's a term pad is something to do with foot these are the footsteps of meaning words are the footsteps of meaning 
and uh, in Sanskrit Pad is uh, about 410, these are if you really look into language, uh, these are the footsteps, Pad, Pad are words or terms. So, if you do word by word or term by term recitation, sounds will differ. So, if somebody has uh, crammed up word by word recitation and somebody has crammed up uh, continuous recitation, the two would be different. The two because H sounds will differ. Then what one does is if one makes a pronunciation of a kind, uh, first word, second word together, then give a temporal pause and then do second word, first word. This is artificial construction. Then give a pause, then do second, third, third, second, etc. What happens with this recitation is that when in word by word recitation edges as sounds of words are shown, when you do this 1 to 2 1, you show the edge sounds as well as the combined sounds. So, how the last sound of word 1 and the first sound of word 2 combined is shown here and how the last sound of word 2 combines with the first sound of word 1 when pronounced in temporal contiguity that is shown. So, uh, this is uh, this is a third kind of recitation. In this recitation, the rule structure of euphony, sandhi, sandhi rule structure is hardwired into this. The sandhi rule structure has been hardwired into this recitation, and these are euphoric, euphoric kind of recitation. Some people do it uh, with euphoria. Any recitation, if you do, you can see that, sense that. And uh, if this is done, this is done and the continuous recitation is done, there is one can see how one can cross check from this, but this is only an elementary level of cross check. There can be a strategy made to really seal, bring a closure, closure strategy so that no sound slips. Uh, sounds can sl still slip because the physiology of sound may change. For instance, uh, Panini says that the sound a uh, is pronounced in 18 ways. When you say a uh, in a well, it is different from when you say a uh, in a air. There are environmental things which change, sounds do change on, over time, but the major content of ascent of uh, of uh, phonemic content that does not change much. So, uh, this is a clue as to how a knowledge body which is uh, is called euphony, sandhi and vichhed that is hardwired into this recitation. Now, one can make their features like ascent for instance cannot be captured by two word relation. Ascent requires maybe six word relation or metric relations. If you are singing, the sound may require uh, metric kind of uh, metric kind of uh, dispersal it has. So, rule of notes cannot be captured by this. A sandhi can be captured by this, and in fact, even sandhi cannot be captured in its full glory because lots of exceptions exist to the universal structure of sandhi exceptions also have to be hardwired into it. And uh, how does one say which is the exception rule, which is the universal rule in this that is not cognized. So, a more elaborate structure is made to cognize that, cognize even so that people looking at that structure can actually see that there are these are exceptions ones and these are universal rules. Okay, uh, I did not bring those structures because there are 9 of them, 7 of them. Uh, they are called jat part, gan part, uh, nested kind of pronunciations etcetera. Because of this kind of things as I said there was a man who died who could pronounce from last syllable to first syllable yajurved. And uh, in fact, uh, in Indian tradition a playfulness among children, it may not be there in your childhood, 
because things have changed. In our childhood, this is there. You also will have some memory of that. There are many games which are done on, which are made on slipic structures. Uh, lots of games are there. In fact, one can, uh, there were games, very elaborate and sophisticated games, where one can create even architecture using sounds. It is an abstract architecture one can create. For instance, you know, girls do this, they insert cha into whatever they are speaking. Uh, cha, cha, after every syllable, cha is inserted, so that, you know, when they speak to friends, uh, friend understands that, because there is an algorithm how to delete that cha and still do uh, the sound is there in them. So, these are kind of examples of lots of games, which are played even they are played in villages today and uh, which are related to this knowledge body. And uh, encoding, there are also artificial languages which are constructed out of it. For example, there is a in Karnataka, there is a village, it is called Sanketi village where the language spoken is only understood in that village. It is a totally artificial language. It is among the Ved parties that language has been constructed and uh, that artificial language is constructed out of the concepts out of this and uh, sounds are something. Uh, before I close, let me say that something called oral formalism like we have formalisms today in say algebra, you write some graphemes, alpha, beta, etcetera, some Greek letters are used to write, uh, symbols are used to write algebraic equation. One can also do something called oral symbolism. Oral symbolism is that certain sounds, for instance, we said that some sounds never come uh, pronounced together. One can construct oral symbolism to represent something. So, artificial languages, oral artificial languages can be made and uh, there existed uh, tens of them in the Indian past and it fueled Indian orality. The oral culture which we have, oral culture means sab chalta hai type of culture which we have. Uh, that is something in which it was there. There is a rationality, a great exercise of reason which went into it. It is a, it is like exercise which you find in Euclid. Euclid is geometry, you are familiar with that Euclidean geometry because classrooms teach it. This is not taught in classrooms and, uh, but in the intro to him, algorithm this can be taught. This can be an actual example giving all kind of things about it and very interestingly oral formalisms can be made and they were not just made. If you have heard a book called Panini's Grammar, it has abstract uh, entities, abstract terms which are not really part of language. It has an oral formalism. The entire grammar in Panini is done through oral formalism. Not only this, a grammar of uh, grammar of uh, say tabla or mridangam is done in oral formalism. A grammar of dance or uh, movements have been done in oral formalism in the tradition. Whole lot of grammars were written. Something if you really have a idea of prakriya or algorithm, only way you can found this idea is through grammars. Formal grammars, there is a chap called Chomsky. The act of uh, one of the great epoch of computer science, epochal change, was to actually come up with a theory of formal grammars. You can find these formal grammars put in this, not, the, not thus in recitation of Ved, but in uh, working out grammars of language, in working out even grammars of performance. Allocution is performance, uh, music is performance, dance is performance, 
there are grammars which are worked out and these grammars are oral. Not only these grammars, even something like uh, similes in poetry, some prosod uh, prosodic kind of uh, aspects of poetry, even they are formalized orally. So, the idea of a rule of uh, meta structures, meta rules and then formalisms which may come up is, is something you guys inherited and uh, these things are taken as for granted something like that. To understand foundations of these things really what idea of prakriya is. Uh, it is not just because you are Indians that you should know this, that there is actual great episode of oral fixing, orally fixing, inscribing text orally, which was behind it. Uh, not just that, even we will see in the next lecture, even some open problems, open problems today about computability remain open here and one can see the see those sites. Purpose of this lecture was that if you look at history of ideas, there is a great panorama of ideas world is and we are all indebted to them. We may have a very constricted mind, very, very sort of uh, small mindscape and we may be thinking that we are educated with a small mindscape because life can be lived just by breathing, there need not be any education in it. But since you are committed to education in some sense by being here and, and to broaden your mindscape thoroughly because the domain of reflectivity would go up, what you can reflect on will go up. Oh, I have sort of overshot. Okay, so to close it, here is a, in this lecture is an example of a fiat of reason and this fiat of reason was there to solve a problem, how to fix text orally, something significant, how to fix it orally. This was a great project uh, done there and one of the effect of this project is lots of traits which we see in Indian civilization are under, can be understood through this. Many humanistic traits can be understood through this and uh, history of uh, mankind is full of such great projects and we will deal with some of them later in the, the first section of this course is about these projects. Okay, thanks. Thanks for bearing for another five minutes.